Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. This is a tutorial on recursion in Java. Several people have asked me to make a tutorial on recursion and at first I didn't want to because um, it's sort of an algorithm rather than uh, in a way being anything to do with Java as such. But uh, then I reflected and I, I realized that in fact recursion is, is considered something basic that all programmers are supposed to learn. So if you're learning Java, you want to learn recursion along with it. So let's take a look at it here. I've got a main method set up in my application Eclipse here. And let's just put a sysout in there to check that it works. And I'll run this and it says, hello. Now I'll define another method here. Um, I'm, I'm going to make this, this other method also static. I might as well make it private because I'm only going to call it from within this class in main. I'll say private static void and I'll call it, let's see, let's just call it for the moment calculate, like, like this. Now, um, the reason I made this static, this has, static has nothing implicitly to do with recursion. It's just that I haven't got an object of this app class, I, and I just want to use a method here directly from within main. And if you want to call a method of a class, then it needs to be static. So rather than do new app and then say app.calculate or something, I'm going to just make um, this method static here. And we, we've covered that before, of course. So I can call calculate from within main, of course. Let's put calculate in there and sys out hello and run that. And this is all completely standard, ordinary Java. Now, supposing I pass a value to calculate, like uh, let's say here, let's say um, int value equals uh, four, let's put four, and then I'll make calculate take an int value and I'll display the value here and I'll pass, pass it in here. Let's run that, check that it works, it says four. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to realize, for the purposes of this tutorial especially, that whatever we do to int value within these brackets will not affect its value here. This is, because um, this is a primitive type, it's like we're sloshing the value 4 from this variable here into this variable here, which is only has the scope of these two brackets here. So if I say something like uh, value um, equals value minus one or something like that and then I run this yeah it'll be three within this method but down here it's still going to be four so let's run that that's an important thing to grasp now um, as, as far as recursion goes we can do something kind of interesting here which is we can make this method call itself that's what recursion is it's where uh, you call a method recursively or to put it another way, um, a subroutine calls a subroutine. So here, I could say, let's say, well, let's let's have this sys out in there actually. Put value. I can now call calculate like that again. And uh, there's no real actually need to have this in a an int here. I can just put it literally there. I just did that to show that it wasn't changed when we change it within the function. It's not changed within this method. So we can call calculate and let's pass value to it. So the method is now calling itself recursively. And this, this code is actually uh, problematic. And if, if we run it, what will happen is we'll get an error. And let's see if I can scroll to the top of this error. It's going to be here somewhere. And there it was. And it says um, stack overflow error. And what this is, is when you call a method, from within another method, like here we're calling calculate from within main. There's a special area of memory uh, in the Java virtual machine called the stack, and the stack is used for local variables and for uh, remembering uh, which method called which method, so we know where to return after the method is recalled. It's used for, after the method is called. It's used for stuff like that. That's distinct from the heap, and the heap is an area of memory which is where objects uh, are allocated when you use the new operator. So the stack is a relatively small area of memory 
that remembers function calls and local variables and stuff like that. And here we're getting a stack overflow error because we've called this function infinitely. We've called this within this. This calls this, which is this, and it's calling itself again. And it kind of goes round and round in an infinite recursive loop um, until uh, we get this stack overflow error. So that's no good. But um, we can, uh, this is legitimate if we provide some way of this this method to stop calling itself at some point. So a problem with recursion and a reason why it's not advisable to use it too much is precisely the danger of stack overflow errors. Uh, if you call a method from within a method too many times, I don't know how many, um, I'm guessing tens of thousands, then you'll get a stack overflow error. And for that reason, it's better to avoid recursion. But there are some situations which we'll look at in which it's very, very useful to use a recursive method. So um, what we can do it here is we could put an if in here, like say if, well actually, actually before I do that let's let's do something slightly more interesting. Let's um, call calculate on value minus one instead. And what's going to happen now is you see we've, we've got the same error again unsurprisingly, but every time it printed out one less than the previous value until we got about 10,000 of them before we got the we got down to minus 10,000 before getting the stack overflow error So calculate Initially has the value 4 which it displays and then it calls calculate with the value um, Minus 1 which is 3 so then we end up coming in here again and the second time it prints 3 and so on But now the interesting thing is it's possible to stop the recursion because I can say something like if value equals 1 then, uh, or maybe even it's, yeah, let's just do that actually. If value equals one, then we can say um, return one, like that. Uh, oh, yeah, we're not returning anything at the moment. Let's just say return, like that. And then if we run that, now it prints 4321. So uh, we're coming in fine, and it's calling calculate for values greater than one, but when it gets to one, it just returns. So we've got one method calling another method. What's this, four, four times, I suppose. Um, yeah, because we call calculate initially with four and we get this and calculate calls itself one, two, I guess three times. Now we can, we can do useful stuff with this and uh, one classic example is to calculate a factorial value. A factorial value is, if you take, for example, um, E dot, let's say example eg uh, the factorial of 4 which we write like this 4 exclamation mark that's not programming terminology or anything that's uh, that's some mathematics terminology 4 factorial I think you write it like that or is it is it like this I, th I think it's like that it doesn't matter anyway 4 factorial is equal to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, although the 1 obviously doesn't matter. So the factorial of any number is equal to the number multiplied by all the numbers below it, so to speak, leaving out 0 because if we multiplied it by 0 at the end, we'd just get 0, of course. And this is this is very useful in probability theory, for example. So this is called the um, factorial, factorial 4 in this case. So the factorial of any number is just this. Now we can calculate that using a recursive function because what I can do is here I can say, um, let's have a return value. Let's make this int. And here I'll say, if the value is one, we'll stop by just returning one. But otherwise, if, if the value is something greater than one, we'll say, we'll call calculate itself on value minus one, but we'll multiply the return value of that by value itself and we'll return this. This is getting a little bit more complicated now and you'll have to think about this probably a little bit unless you're cleverer than me uh, to um, get your head around it. Let's, let's run, <coughs> excuse me, let's run this again. Uh, and now what I, what I can do is I can print out return value actually here. So here, and let's run this. And now the factorial of four is 24. And um, 
I can let's I can also rename this to factorial, which might be might be handy. Like like this. So now we've got a function that calculates the factorial. I need to rename this as well. Of any number passed to it, factorial five or whatever. And uh, to see how this works, it's um, it's probably going to help if you just think through what it does for small values. So if we call this this method here, I'm using like function and method interchangeably. It's it's a method because it's part of an object, but you could also call it a function or subroutine if you like. Um, subroutine programming lingo, function is more a mathematics lingo, but it's all good. So. Um, function uh, takes in usually a number and returns a number um, and let's say we pass in one what would happen is we'd come in here and it would say is value one yes return one so this would display one so we, we pass in one here we just get one like this uh, if we pass in two what happens is we come in here with the value two and it says is the value one no it's not so it doesn't do this it comes down here and it calls factorial on 1, in other words, 2 minus 1, which is 1, times 2. So we're taking 2 here and multiplying it by factorial 1. 2 times 1 is, of course, 2. And um, so that this, the factorial of 1, will just return here. We'll just get 1. So if we call it with 2, here it's 2. And it doesn't execute that. It executes this. That's 2. This will end up being 1. So 2 times 1 um, is what is returned in the end from the, from the function. And that's factorial 2 is 2. I don't know if that sounded hideously confusing or helpful. But um, either way, I'd, I'd advise just going through this logic for yourself. Imagine what this will do for the value 1 and then the value 2 and, and so on. Um, I'm not sure what factorial 0 is, actually. I, I so probably it's defined as zero, but we might want to think about how to define factorial zero, but this will do to illustrate recursion. And if we pass in three, um, it's it's going to do three times two times one. So we've got an extra step to it. It comes in here and it says, okay, three times whatever factorial three minus one is, in other words, factorial of two. Um, and then it, so it's coming in here a second time and saying, okay, we'll do... Um, two times whatever the factorial of two is and uh, all these values get stored basically on the on the stack and the end result is you're calculating factorial three i think once you once you've got your head around what's going on when you're passing one and when you pass in two it starts to become fairly clear what will happen for three and four and five and so on and you, you get the idea you could spend days thinking about this until you your understanding of it is as great as your understanding is of uh, you know pulling out a chair from underneath the table but it's probably not worth it to have that degree of clarity you'll, you'll get the idea if you just look at a few small values of this um, so this this is a classic example where you use recursion the important thing to remember with recursion is always always make sure that it's going to stop somewhere and, and don't try to make it recurse uh, thousands of times stick with small numbers otherwise you could get a stack overflow error Another classic example where we use recursion is, um, let's take a look, is uh, if you look at the Towers of Hanoi puzzle, Towers of Hanoi, there's, a, there's an explanation of this on Wikipedia, this simple game, which uh, looks complex and intimidating at first, but it's actually relatively simple. Um, the Towers of Hanoi puzzle is you have these discs on these rods and you've got to move the discs by moving one disc at a time onto another rod and you're only allowed, you're not allowed to ever put a bigger disc on a smaller disc and the, the puzzle is to move the tower from, move the entire stack to another rod one disc at a time obeying these, these rules. And uh, if you look down here somewhere we've got an explanation of the recursive solution and although this looks a bit intimidating, uh, it's, it's actually um, in some ways easier to understand than calculating a factorial, I find. And where, where recursive algorithms really shine is if you can see what to do for one step of this puzzle, then you can use a recursive solution that applies that step over and over again.
and um, solves the whole whole puzzle in a very elegant manner with surprisingly little code. It's, it's, it's better to use loops in general than recursion, but in this case, using a loop would be uh, actually quite hard to figure out mentally, whereas the recursive solution uh, turns out to be pretty simple. You're kind of looking at the end result and saying, okay, what would I have to do to get to one step before that end result where the, all the all the tower has been moved and create a, write a method that does that and then say, okay, we can use the same method to get to one step before the um, the solution that's one step before the final step, if you see what I mean. The, the, if you can solve the, the um, second to last step, or I guess it will be the last step, then you can solve the second to last step in the same way, and the third to last step, and so on, just by using a recursive uh, method. So if you want practice with recursive methods, try to calculate a factorial, and then I would say come to this Wikipedia page and see if you can implement a recursive solution for the Towers of Hanoi puzzle. And actually, that you'll also need some way of representing these disks using um, maybe a Java collection class or something. Or if that's too complicated, don't worry about it, because the most basic thing that you need to grasp first is just calculating a factorial or something like that. And when you can do that, you basically grasped recursion. So um, that's it for this tutorial. I'll put this code, as always, on caveofprogramming.com. And if you go to www.caveofprogramming.com, there you can find lots of free videos and some free articles as well and some free courses and lots of other courses that include free videos. So you can just click on this and go look straight at some free videos. And the source code for this is going to be, if you scroll down to the YouTube videos section, you'll find it um, under the appropriate, um, well, this is actually going to be in the basic Java video tutorials and it'll be down here somewhere when I get around to adding this source code. Just click on a page in this section and you'll find the source code. So that's it for this tutorial and until next time, happy coding.